Right, good evening everybody and welcome to uh, the first of a new series of uh, events organised by the Institute for Policy Research. Uh, the last series, if I remember rightly, was on the theme of polycrisis and so uh, that seems to set the scene for uh, the new series which are about challenges facing Britain. Uh, uh, my name is James Copestake, I'm Professor of International Development and um, I didn't think that my international development career would take me back to the UK in quite the way it has. Uh, and I'm, uh, I've got the, the honour to uh, welcome our guest to launch this new series, um, uh, Gwyn Bevan from the LSC. Uh, and uh, so the title you will all be aware of, um, which is How Did it Britain Get to Be Like This?, uh, We've been treated, if that's the right word, to lots of uh, insight into how Britain got to be the way it is in the last decade, thanks to Laura Kunzberg and uh, Rory Stewart and uh, books by Theresa May. And that was just the last 10 years. And, uh, and now we're going to hear um, some reflections on the longer view um, of uh, uh, UK um, governance over a century. Makes me wonder what happened in the century before, but uh, we'll leave that one hanging. Um, so, uh, Gwyn is uh, Emeritus Professor of Policy Analysis at the London School of Economics, where he headed up the School of Management for a period of time. Uh, from that base in academia, he's engaged in work on UK policy in relation to uh, the police and the fire service, uh, publicly funded uh, legal services, international aid, uh, and public health. So lots of insights into different aspects of UK government uh, from which to draw um, in this book, which he tells me started out at the beginning of, um, of, of COVID. So uh, we're really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. We'll give you uh, half an hour or maybe a bit more and then lots of chance for question and answers. So do um, uh, get your questions ready as, as we proceed. Uh, I should say that this event is being recorded. Uh, we're not running it live, so it is a, a, an in-person event only, but it will be available subsequently. And I should also say that the book isn't actually in the bookshelves yet, but if you take one of the flyers, you can um, order yourself a discounted copy. Um, uh, to follow up on the talk. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay, so thank you very much, and over to you. Okay. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Is, it, is the sound working? Okay, you can all hear me? Yeah. Great pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, what I'm trying to do is to make sense of what's happened to Britain over my lifetime. I see there are others of a similar age to me here who must be puzzling about this too. Um, but it's very much about the younger people who are here because it's about your future and how we need it to be different. What I'm going to try and do is talk for a relatively short time to allow plenty of time for questions and clarification and discussion. Um, there are two main parts to this. One is to set the framework, and this is this history which is going to be very brief uh, up till 1951. And what I'm focusing on is what's happened since 1979, which is, I, I describe these as two political settlements there was the, that really shaped the way we govern Britain. The first one was the landmark settlement by Clement Attlee's Labour government at the end of the Second World War that's described as having established the welfare state and set in place the systems in which we were governed under succeeding Conservative and Labour governments. And the second one was Margaret Thatcher's Conservative government from 1979 to 1991 that similarly set a completely different foundational set of principles under which our systems have governed. The theme of the book is every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. That is, the reason why things are so terrible is because they're designed to be that way. And what I'm trying to do is to explain how on earth we ever got there. 
This is a former director of LSE, Sir William Beveridge. <laughs> and it is extraordinary that this white paper on social insurance and allied services was a bestseller with people queuing up outside a Majesty's Station office to buy copies. William Beveridge was one of the great of the good, and indeed, in his own opinion, he was one of the best. <laughs> and he was actually incredibly difficult to work with, which is why he was uh, encouraged to leave LSE and found it so hard to get a job in government, despite his enormous abilities. And after having got into government, after a year, he got under the skin of Ernest Bevan, the then Minister of Labour, and he was banished to Whitehall's equivalent of Siberia. This is a task like the Eighth Labour of Hercules to chair a working party with these extremely arid terms of reference that people thought would send him away so he'd have no impact on government in future. But they got this completely wrong because what he understood was, this is in John Stuart Mill's famous phrase, if you can inform the passion of the multitude against the self-interest of the few, you can await the outcome with quiet satisfaction. And he did that in two ways. One was this shocking piece of analysis he did to show that the grinding poverty that so many people suffered in the depressed areas of Britain, which were other, all areas other than the Midlands and the South East, with high unemployment and the stigmatisation, humiliation and grinding poverty, the means test could have been avoided. The country could easily have afforded to do that. And this is an iconic picture of the famous Jarrow Crusade where men marched 200 miles from Jarrow in the northeast of England to London looking for work. And the second way in which he uh, informed the passion of the multitude was this famous identification of what he described as the five giant evils. Uh, and he developed in his report a system of social security and cradle of the grave, which he saw as tackling want. But he recognised that the key giant evil was that of idleness. And in 1944, the coalition government produced a white paper on employment that committed following governments to high and stable levels of employment. In 1944, the coalition government introduced the Education Act that to introduce, a, a, for the first time, a free system, a system of state edu secondary education for free. And my famous namesake, and I've yet to prove I'm related to him, and Aaron Bevan, Minister of Health, was responsible for establishing the NHS and a commitment of a programme of building council houses of quality. The thing to note, and the thing was, what's extraordinary was the Atlee government established a systems to tackle all these five giant evils. And this is Peter Hennessy's verdict on that government. He's a great chronicler of the 20th century, pointing out that they transformed Britain for the better in a way unmatched by governments before or since. That was in 1993, and 40 years later, that judgment still holds. What I want you to notice is the way in which the Atlee government put together an eclectic set of policies for people across the political spectrum, Liverpool, um, liberals, conservatives and Labour, to tackle what were the problems of the 1920s and 1930s. But unfortunately, 50 years on, the, these systems were failing. And the particular uh, failure that identified by the cons Margaret Thatcher's Conservative Party in the decisive election campaign of 1979 was this famous poster highlighting the failure to deliver high and stable levels of unemployment. Two years later, Ronald Reagan, her soulmate, also heralded the implementation of neoliberal reforms in the United States. And he summarised in one sentence what they both believed in, which is that what they needed to do was attack governments and implement markets in their place. In 1989, uh, Margaret Thatcher's mantra, there is no alternative to her neoliberal market-based policies, seemed to be vindicated by the collapse of communism, and this is the destruction of the Berlin Wall. An analysis showed, if you look at this natural experiment, 
across the two parts of Germany, that under communism delivered standards of living a quarter of those in the market-based West. Now, if you ask where neoliberalism gets its, its justification from, the neoliberal economists at the Chicago Department of Economics trace it back to Adam Smith, who seems to extol the virtues of self-interest in a market. But the point I want to make is that, uh, although he does that, bread satisfies a very stringent set of conditions in terms of your capability to know what you're getting and pay for it, and the market structure in terms of this being competitive in many buyers and sellers. And basically, what we now know is where those conditions are satisfied, they are those, as in elementary micro microeconomics, the pros the market works. There are what are described as low transaction costs. It's very easy to make the market work. And you can rely on, again, uh, Adam Smith's uh, graphic phrase, the invisible hand, to coordinate things superbly. And it, you'd be foolish to try and do anything else, which is indeed what they tried to do in Russia and China under state control of agriculture, resulting in famines in which millions died. But the difficulty we have is there are very few goods and services which all those conditions are satisfied. So the question is, if only some conditions are satisfied, what do we then do? And leading economists in the 1940s looked at goods and services where there was a risk of market failure. And they identified a long list, and they argued that because of risk of market failure, you shouldn't use the invisible hand of the market, but you could use government. And that was certainly proved right in Britain for the private services for railways and coal that were in a terrible state at the start of the Second World War. In the 1980s, the neoliberal revolution said, actually, the trouble with government is it's nothing like as dynamic as private enterprise. And although there are problems here uh, in getting the market to work, we know so much more now than we did in the 1940s so we can develop systems of contracting and regulation to handle all these problems. And so what we ought to do, and this is where we have the visible hand of the market, because you're relying on things you can see in terms of regulation and contracts, that would be much better than government. Uh, the question is, how does that work for the utilities? We know uh, that government was, you know, that, that the market worked for insurance, cars, iron and steel, chemical industries and telephones. They were right there. But what about utilities? Now, looking back, this now seems a completely hubristic belief we had in 1989. The first Director General of what Ian Byatt, who'd worked in the Treasury and saw the failures of the nationalised industries, was confident that, through regulation, he could introduce what would have happened if there could have a perfectly competitive market for water and sewage, which, of course, you cannot have. It's a natural monopoly. This is completely different from constructing a market for bread. But the other strand of neoliberalism was not just we can make markets work in difficult areas, but the only thing we expect private enterprises do is to maximise profit. And that was profoundly influential uh, subsequent to the 1970s. And of course what we've had then is the growth of organisations through private equity that are absolutely dedicated to maximising profit. And the Guardian reported back 20 years ago, Chris Goodall warned that if the Competition and Markets Authority, that if you let water and sewage authority be taken over by private equity, off what would lose regulatory control over sewage. And that is, of course, what has happened. The other strand, another strand of neoliberalism, is that rather than getting government to supply services, we can outsource this to private suppliers. Now, this has, does have obvious transaction costs, um, the government, there, is no, there aren't many buyers. Typically, the government is the only buyer. Although this competition in bidding for the contract, once it's let, you're in a monopoly position. This is the problem government has all the time when contracts for major information systems <coughs> go wrong. They're left with a firm having spent millions of pounds, not delivering the objectives, way behind on time, but has no alternative but to pay them to continue to do the work. And the other issue we have is because the services we're dealing with are so com complicated, unlike bread, 
you cannot fully specify in the contract and it's incomplete. All of that makes government contracting incredibly difficult. The reason, but the reasons why we do it so badly is it's not seen as something that people in government should take seriously. This is something for junior people to handle. So when we have people from the private sector come and contribute to our course at LSE, they explain that the private contractor sends their five-star generals into government to negotiate and meet people in their 20s. But then we've also had... So that's the problem of the demand side. It's difficult and not seen as important. And on the supply side, we've also had the transformation through financialization, which is what, to make money and enrich uh, the people who run companies, they engage in mergers and acquisitions. That uh, generates money for speculators, speculators, executives and investment banks. But it obviously reduces competition because all the, the contractors then merge into a relatively small number. And it also reduces their competence because they spread their capacity across a whole range of services in which they are no longer expert, which fundamentally undermines the rationale of outsourcing. The rationale of outsourcing is by contracting with another organisation, they have expertise I lack as government. But what they're doing here is contracting with an organisation driven by making money that lacks the expertise to do this work, and they bid for contracts at very low cost that they cannot deliver. The classic example of that is Carillion. Carillion, through mergers and acquisition, become a strategic supplier on a massive scale. It was liquidated in 2018. That is to say, it didn't go bankrupt. If you go bankrupt, you have an administrator and assets of value. They had no assets of value. Uh, and in a sense, we're not surprised. If you, I mean, a New York hedge fund made millions by speculating on its collapse but government continues to issue its contracts despite profit warnings. Of course, the government's troubled, but if they don't keep giving it contracts, it will collapse and have a huge problem. This is kicking the can down the road. Given, as I described about the government's lackadaisical approach to contracting, it's not surprising that it poorly maintained its prisons and the prison hospitals it built had huge structural flaws. But what I find really horrifying about this case and there's this devastating report by a House of Commons Select Committee, is the series of regulatory failures by all these different bodies that should have overseen what was going on. The Remuneration Committee, it violated the Prompt Payment Code. The Auditor gave misleading accounts. The Financial Reporting Council saw that it was going wrong, didn't act against the Auditor. And the, there was also a, a pension uh, regulator let the, the pensions have a deficit. So... Uh, I'm getting towards the end now, by the way. <laughs> There's only so much of this you can say, I know, but the, the, the worst is yet to come, I'm afraid. Um, so you can understand why government services don't work too well, because the systems we've got are not designed to make them work well. But the thing that's really, really troubling is the degree to which geographical inequalities in Britain have become entrenched and paralleled with other countries. This is the uh, Financial Times, this wonderful data analyst, John Byrne Murdoch, who recently did this analysis looking at the contributions to GDP per capita of the richest cities in each country. As you can see, it ranges from 1% to 4%. So what's London's contribution to the UK? It's a staggering 17%. And the point he makes is if you take London out, the rest of the UK GDP per capita is poorer than Mississippi. If you look across Europe in terms of regional inequalities of gross domestic product per capita, um, the, the two countries I've picked for comparisons here are those which would we'd expect to have serious structural inequalities. Germany, because of the years of communism in East Germany. And as you can see, um, what had happened over since communism is they've levelled up the poorest regions in the East are as, as well off as those poorest regions in the West. Italy, of course, has, has the problem of the South, and three of these regions are handicapped by varieties of organised crime. But despite these structural explanations, you observe threefold differences in inequality. And I always find this <laughs> incredible. For Britain, it is an eightfold difference 
that completely dwarfs these other countries. And the other thing to notice, so you can't see it too well here, is that Britain is actually now, the poorest regions in Britain are now poorer than the regions of East Germany. The explanation, as you all know, is that we have these three dimensions of inequality, income, location and education, and they're all linked to each other. So if you're a child from a rich family, you're brought up in a stress-free environment, can go to a good school, and you get a good degree, uh, and then to move to a desirable location, you get the bank of mum and dad, and you can get high income. Uh, and what we're dealing with is the impact of the financial age on the housing market. Again, this is Milton Friedman's doctrine that social responsibility of business is to maximise profits. Actually, if you look at normal markets, these are three great enterprises, General Electric, ICI and Boeing, and their accounts explain how financialization has resulted in their demise. If you look at the housing market, we've seen this dramatic increase in the average profit per house by house builders of tenfold in an eight-year period. And, of course, what we've got here is this system in which the super-rich move into the housing market and send ripple effects right through it to make housing and affordable everywhere. So in place in Westminster and the city, of course, you know, this is a ratio of 25-fold of prices to median earnings. But in desirable places like Oxford, dear, where I live, and your very lovely city of Bath and Cambridge, Oxford, Bath, Cambridge, London, part of the Golden Triangle, we have these unaffordable houses for people who live and work there. And what I find really <laughs> troubling... This is an analysis from 2018-21 uh, showing about a quarter, you know, areas where about a quarter of the population live in poverty. Uh, and not surprisingly, we get Wales and the North East, traditionally areas that have been left behind, but also notice London. And, what I, what's, and you know, if you look at GDP per capita now, we're five times better off than we were in 1936 when Beveridge uh, argued we could have abolished want. So if we could have abolished want in 1936, why is it so prevalent now when we're five times richer? Uh, then finally, I conclude, Ronald Reagan, in laying out in one sentence what neoliberalism was about, began his inaugural address by talking about the orderly transfer of power, pointing out that it was taken for granted in the United States and other countries looked upon it as a miracle. Forty years on, of course, that miracle ended. There's this great book by Fiona Hill, brought up in Bishop Auckland, who moved from Cole House to White House as advisor to Trump. His family live in Bishop Auckland and talks about what's been going on and the neoliberalism in the United States and the UK having very strong echoes and explain why we've had Brexit and Trump. So my conclusion is in our current crisis, market failures are the problem for government which is why we need a new political settlement. Thank you very much.